thank you all for being with me here tonight. Um, I understand that there's uh, quite a few of you there at the house. Uh, as you all know, this is the first Tuesday of the month, and it's our little tradition to invite everyone to stick around after the talk for tea and uh, just uh, socializing, getting together, visiting with one another, talking about uh, the Dharma. And uh, so for tonight, I thought I would uh, just begin by pointing out that there is generally, typically, there is a first insight that people have when they begin practicing. Uh, when they begin practicing Vipassana, there is an initial insight that generally everyone comes to. And this initial insight, well, first, if we just kind of pause for a moment, can you just consider what might this first insight be? What is the first insight of insight meditation? I've mentioned it before. And um, I think a lot of times people, uh, it's interesting, maybe you can notice this right now, how the mind begins to create some sort of fantastic story of what the first insight of practice might be. And so just considering what is the first insight? All right, well, so the first insight is simply recognizing how busy the mind is. That's the first insight. When you come to insight meditation practice, you sit, you close your eyes, you follow the basic instructions, and typically what, what really comes into focus is, wow, this mind is busy. This mind is all over the place. This mind is wild. And sometimes that, uh, you know, we don't really recognize that that's a very valuable insight. It's a very valuable insight just to simply recognize how easily the mind is pulled into one direction or another, how easily the mind gets captured and caught up in, in fabrication in, in this story generating uh, capacity that the mind has. That is a that is an insight. And it it may it may sound strange for me to say this, but this is an insight that not everyone comes to. Unless you have taken the time to sit, to become still and to observe your mind, you may not actually recognize just how easily the mind gets carried away. We, uh, as practitioners, as meditators, we really come to recognize this. We see this very clearly, how the mind is so easily distracted, so easily caught up in uh, narration and judgment, uh, distractions of imagination, uh, stories around the past, stories of the potential future. But for someone else, um, you know, they may not recognize just how lost they can be in thought. We, uh, without uh, a real effort, we spend the majority of our lives lost in thought, caught up in these stories of the mind. And so when you begin practice, this is the first insight. This is one of these things that you quickly come to realize. And so maybe many of you have begun to realize, to begin to recognize just how often the mind is outside of this present moment. And as you begin to investigate that, you can also begin to recognize what it's like when the mind is actually present. And I'm sure some of you can feel into this question I'm about to ask, what's it like when the mind is present? 
one of the things that I will share with people is that happiness, joy, joy is only found in the present moment. We can have a memory of a joyful time, but the feeling, the experience, the direct experience of joy only happens in the present moment. So if we're lost in thought, if we're lost in some sort of story, we're missing out on the joy of the present moment. As you begin to see how easily it is for the mind to get pulled away, you really begin to recognize how rich and important and full of life, the richness of being in the present moment is. So what I'm sharing with you tonight is fundamental. It's very basic, but it's also something that we tend to kind of overlook. We start to consider how long we've been practicing and we start to think of, you know, maybe some stories that certain people, Dharma friends or even teachers have shared with us. And we start to create maybe a new type of story, a, a Dharma story in the mind that somehow there's something more to be experienced. There's something, some hidden instruction, hidden teaching. We might not recognize how the mind could be really caught up in what is oftentimes referred to as the comparing mind. We hear of one of our Dharma friends and we hear of their depths of concentration. We hear of their stability of mind. We maybe see in them a, a joy that we don't see in ourselves. And we think, yeah, am I missing something? Should I be practicing in some way that will lead me to what this person is exhibiting in their life? Why am I not experiencing this joy, this happiness? So comparing mind can come up for us. And particularly, particularly, even when we are far along in our practice, we can begin to think that there's something more. There's something more that I should be experiencing. And so I'm talking about these fundamental insights because it can be so helpful just to come back to the simple instructions of practice, to become still, to direct the attention inward, to make that mindful connection with the breath, to be present. To begin to re-explore that first insight that you've all had when you stepped onto this path. Wow, the mind is a busy place. And the, with the way the mind gets pulled from here to there, even when we're well practiced, we can start to fall into these refined stories that the mind will tell us. We've graduated from a simple story of, oh, it'd be nice to be on vacation right now, to, oh, it would be nice to experience this, this Dharma insight that I've read about in the suttas. And we miss seeing the very fundamental truth of, ah, oh, this is just comparing mind. This is just the mind creating a duality. And so here's maybe just another insight. You know, there's so many instructions uh, in even in different traditions of practice that talk about non-duality, duality and non-duality. And this can begin to sound very interesting, very, you know, fanciful. What is this non-duality? What is this duality? And it can get really philosophical and really, you know, rich with, oh, wow, this is something that I have to really dive into and explore. 
And I'm really keen on keeping things simple. And to me, duality is really everything that I've been talking about thus far. It is the mind missing what's here right now, this present moment experience, this direct experience, this reality, and creating a false reality, a fabricated reality, a reality, a story in the mind, of a, an illusory quality of mind. That's the duality. So what is non-duality? Non-duality is a mind that is centered in the present moment. It is a mind that is experiencing the one reality. And so when we begin to practice, we're cultivating this ability to see clearly so that we can step into that one reality where we're not in this place of conflict, where my idea of something is now in conflict with the reality of something where I get attached to my idea, but then am faced with the reality that my idea is somehow built upon. Talking about practice in this way, it, uh, to me, I find it inspiring in that it feels workable. Coming from, you know, some background with other traditions of practice, uh, it's very easy for somebody to get lost in duality and non-duality and this philosophical idea of some hidden reality. But it really is very simple. Be present, be mindful. Notice when the mind is moving outside of the present. Do your best to see as clearly as possible. In other words, be as mindful as you can. Be present, clearly knowing your direct experience, meeting it, giving yourself that opportunity to come to a deeper understanding of the present moment. Then the more you practice this, the more you begin to abide there. It is your home. You begin to reside in that direct experience, in that present moment experience, in that one reality. So, Earlier on in my practice, kind of a, when I was a more formal pursuit of practice, I, I found this kind of instruction interesting. And, and I think that's part of why um, I also appreciate when it can be simplified. I think for many people, there is an intellectual tantalizing that is offered through the Dharma. And we can get lost in that. And so when I hear something that I find for myself to be simplifying, I tend to want to share it. This past weekend, I attended a day retreat. And um, it was a place here in Dallas, which is where I'm at right now. <clears throat> and the location is called Brahma Vihara Monastery. And it is a, it is a new location that's still uh, developing, still growing. So you can really see there the roots of this wonderful um, place of practice and how it is growing. And it, it, it reminded me a little bit of, um, of MOI. <clears throat> um, 
but this is more of a monastery. Uh, the person leading this place is, um, is a monastic, Bhante Sumedha. And so I had the great pleasure of meeting Bhante Sumedha. And he is a Sri Lankan monk. He's about 63 years old. He's, um, I, I just got such a wonderful, warm uh, feeling in meeting him and talking with him about the Dharma. Um, so I attended this, this uh, day-long retreat, uh, this day retreat there. It was actually from uh, 9, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And the first sit was two and a half hours long. And I don't think it had to be two and a half hours long. I mean, I, I could have gotten up and moved around, but um, uh, I've got a good friend there in Omaha and occasionally he and I would do a three hour sit together. So I just, I just sat. And so for that first sit of the day from for starting at 9 a.m., I sat for two and a half, hour, two and a half hours until there was a very obvious break. And then I, I got up and did some, some walking practice and, and prepared for our afternoon meal. But the Brahma Vihara Monastery is, um, it's conducted out of a home, a home that will eventually grow into uh, a monastery, not a monastery, but more of a temple environment where Vipassana practice uh, is offered and where Dharma instruction is given by Bhante Sumedha. And um, so there was a walk, period of walking meditation and then more sitting. And at one point, uh, Bhante gave a Dharma talk. And it was such a, it was such a wonderful talk. And it was just so, it was that wonderful, fundamental, simple instruction. Here's the Four Noble Truths, here's the path, here's taking refuge. Uh, it was just, it was wonderful. And he, uh, he's very well spoken. And I very much enjoyed it. And it occurred to me that while I was there, that he reminded me of one of my first Dharma teachers, formal Dharma teachers. Bhante Sumedha, he, he was wearing robes the maroon, maroon colored robes, um, bald, you know, as a monastic, and he had glasses. And that very much reminded me of uh, Nonan, Nonan Chaudhre, which uh, I believe I've got his last name right, Chaudhre. Um, but Nonan was the founding abbot of the Nebraska Zen Center there in Omaha, Nebraska. And I used to go to the Zen Center before I started uh, MOI, and I would practice with Nonan. And so Nonan uh, was one of these first uh, influential Dharma teachers for me. Uh, it was a Soto Zen practice, and even then I was an insight practitioner, but it was just really wonderful to come into a community of practitioners, even though it was Soto Zen. I still found a great support there practicing with Nonan and uh, the people of that Sangha. And so when I went to this day retreat with Bhante Sumedha, this was on Saturday. And, and I noticed that my mind was really, for, for some reason, it was really going to the times that I had practiced Shishin. Shishin is a uh, it's a it's a retreat, like a weekend retreat, a weekend shishin, or even longer. And it, my mind was just really going to those uh, early days uh, where I would practice with with Nonan. Um, and I mean, not terribly early in my practice, but still. Um, and, I, and I was just really, I, I thought it was simply, you know, uh, Bhante Sumedha reminds me of of Nonan. Because Nonan would wear his robes. He was a monastic. Uh, he had the bald head. He wore glasses. And his robes were blue and uh, generally blue um, from like this the Soto uh, Zen tradition. And just all these fond memories coming up for me during this retreat of practicing with Nonan, of 
And, and I remember one of the things that I found uh, so fascinating about uh, receiving Dharma instruction from Nonan is at the end of one of his Dharma talks, he would take questions. And one thing that I eventually caught on on, I caught in on. Uh, so, so a lot of people typically they they regarded Nonan as being kind of rough around the edges. Uh, not everyone kind of appreciated his teaching style. And but one of these things that I noticed early on is if a student was asking Nonan a question at the end of one of his Dharma talks that was coming from a place of ego. Nonan was very harsh with them, very rough with them, just really to the point or didn't even really answer the question. He could see so clearly that it was coming from this place of ego. And then when someone was coming with a very sincere question, he, he could somehow tap into that. And I began to see this, this play. And when somebody would ask a very sincere question, what is, what is, can you help me understand? He was so compassionate in his answer. He was so kind. He was so connected and present with that person. And then again, somebody would ask a question from a place of ego. So what does it, what does that mean? It's kind of like when you ask a question and you already know the answer and you want to see if the teacher knows the answer. Or you want to ask the question in such a way that makes uh, you look important and very educated in the Dharma to everyone that's gathered. Uh, it's where this question really comes from, this place of self-centeredness. You're not really looking, you're not really looking to be uh, fed by the Dharma. You're, you're, you're just showing off. And no one could see that. And I began to recognize it too. And it was just, it was always such, it was such a valuable teaching to me just to see this play out of how known it would be, you know, really just quick with a, you know, just a real quick answer. Or he would turn the question back around and ask the student the question. He just, he just wasn't playing games. He was there to offer the Dharma for, for, for those who really were seeking. He was there to offer his guidance and support as a, as a, as a teacher. And he wasn't there to play games. And it was really a remarkable thing. It was uncanny. And again, you know, if that's all I saw, that would be, that would be you know, that would be really weird, right? But it wasn't all I saw. What I saw was that when someone came with a, a deep question that they were struggling with, or you could see they weren't they weren't there to show off. They had a they had a sincere question that they they needed help with. His answers were so he would take his time and he would in, he would really make sure that he connected with that person and he verified. Do you, do you did you get the answer? Do you understand what I'm what I'm sharing with you? It was it was a beautiful thing, and it was a really valuable teaching for me. And um, and in the past, uh, some people have commented that I somehow, in some way, do the same thing. Although I try to just be, uh, you know, playing it safe and just letting my answers always come from that place of, you know, I don't know where you're coming from, but here's where I'm coming from. But I really appreciated that about knowing it was uh, it was a teaching that was exhibited in in him. It was it was a Dharma lesson that he embodied. And 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 when he would answer those questions that came from a place of ego for people, the way he answered wasn't just like, oh, he's being mean. It was a teaching in itself. He wasn't he was talking to the ego of you know to this uh, selfing nature that we all carry around with us he was very skillful and i hope in some way that my sharing this story about him and how he would take questions um i hope i'm um 
being skillful in how I share that with you. After the retreat this, this past weekend on Saturday, uh, there was somebody there that I was practicing with, and they they commented on uh, to me that it was really nice to have me there, and um, and they asked a little bit about my my own uh, Dharma practice, uh, and and for some reason I I answered with known and in mind. I said that I, I had ton, done some time practicing uh, in that style of of Zen practice. And a lot of times I don't really go there with uh, offering some, uh, just a simple answer to, hey, how long have you been practicing the Dharma? Uh, but for some reason I did. It was a beautiful day. It was very hot. Dallas has been very hot. It's very hot and humid here. Uh, uh, like uh, right now it's in the evening and it's about seven o'clock and uh, it's a hundred degrees. And it's, I think it got to be a 102 today. So it's very hot. And this past Saturday, it was also very hot. I did walking meditation outside of, uh, of the uh, Brahma Vihara monastery in the shade. And it was still just very hot. You know, you, you can't wait to get back inside. But it was, you know, it was good. It was a good day of practice, um, sitting, walking, hearing the Dharma, and then more sitting, more walking. The next day, um, when I uh, when I came home uh, that evening, uh, just a typical evening. Um, coming home to um, food and, and then taking rest then uh, the next day. But at some point thereafter, I can't remember if it was Sunday or Monday. I think maybe it was Monday. No, it was Sunday. Yeah, I think it was Sunday. I had an old friend of mine send me a message through my website. So for those of you who didn't know, I have a website. <laughs> Uh, so this is just my how to get in touch with me if you are looking for um, support from uh, a teacher, if you're interested in practicing, getting uh, some practice instruction, um, and it gives you a little bit of information about me as a teacher. Well, so an old friend of mine who I knew from practicing with Nonan uh, sent me a message through my website, and uh, she said, I don't know if you heard or not, but I wanted to let you know that Nonan passed away on Friday. And then it kind of, uh, it was, I kind of realized I think I realized why Nonan was on my mind so much during that retreat. So something I thought I would share. And this is from the Dhammapada. Just like a blossom bright colored but scentless a well-spoken word is fruitless when not carried out so i'll read that again just like a blossom bright colored but scentless a well-spoken word is fruitless when not carried out just like a blossom bright colored and full of scent a well-spoken word is fruitful when well carried out. And this made me think of Nonan and his teachings. So I'll read the whole thing again. Just like a blossom, bright colored but scentless, 
a well-spoken word is fruitless when not carried out. Just like a blossom, bright colored and full of scent, a well-spoken word is fruitful when well carried out. And for me, I think that that captures what it was like to receive the Dharma from Nonan. It was something that, when spoken, it was also embodied. Like a blossom. bright in color and full of scent. And so receiving that news that Nonan had passed away on Friday and that I attend uh, a, a day-long retreat um, the next day, and Nonan was on my mind. Nonan was on my mind a lot. And and the merit of the practice that I did with the Nebraska Zen Center. And so this all goes back to here you are, you're practicing with Mindfulness Outreach Initiative. You're coming to a, an old house that was built in 1885 to sit on the floor on a cushion and and see the mind for what it is, to see the mind and all of its workings, to see how it wanders, to see the benefit in, in taming the mind and bringing it back to the present moment, to gain instruction, valuable Dharma instruction from the teachers who teach for MOI, from Anne. Mark and Kyle and myself. And these memories, these experiences that you're having as you practice, <clears throat> these memories can be things that inspire you. And you can enjoy a memory mindfully, centered in the present moment and recognizing fully that it is a memory and it can be something that inspires and encourages you to continue on with your practice. There's a few of you that I've had um, the pleasure of meeting with individually. And every once in a while, it becomes very clear to me and I say it. And what I say is this to those individuals. I say to some people, you're going to practice the Dharma for the rest of your life. And I have a strong suspicion that when I say that, it's, it's based on the evidence that I've been given from those interactions. And what a wonderful prediction. You're going to practice the Dharma for the rest of your life. And that's good. This is such time well spent. It's important to align yourself with reality. to be on guard and to be able to recognize what is not true, what is the mind telling stories, what is fabricated. And it's not just recognizing the fabrication of your own mind. There's the cultivation of wisdom, of the discerning quality of mind to recognize the fabrications of others' minds. And when you have the wisdom to be able to see that, what arises is compassion. It 
to see someone who is caught up in a story, suffering in that illusory story of the mind. And they may even be suffering to the extent where that suffering is spilling out of their lives into the lives of those around them. Their delusion, their misunderstanding, their confusion. And when you have the Dharma and you're so rooted in the Dharma, you'll see that, ah, this is suffering. I'm witnessing this suffering for this person. And you'll want to respond with compassion. You'll respond with metta, kindness and understanding. And you'll respond with wisdom, which means you'll know how to take care of yourself in how you respond to someone who is maybe going through those challenging, difficult times, hurtful times. So what's it like for you when you notice your mind lost in story? And what's it like when you come home to the present moment and see clearly? Can you feel into that? When you come home to the present moment, is what I say true? Is joy found in the present moment? Bhikkhu Analyo, in his instructions of uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, he points to this very subtle, pleasant feeling tone that can be touched into experience when the mind is present. And so I would just encourage you to begin to be open to experiencing that. In your cultivation of the mind, incline the mind to recognizing that subtle, pleasant feeling tone in being present. You don't need to go looking for it, just being open to it so that you might recognize it when it's there. And this brings me to um, something that I thought I would share from Joseph Goldstein. And this is um, really talking about um, the merit of practice. And I feel like this is very apropos considering, you know, there is a merit to the practice of one who dedicates their life to the Dharma. Individuals like Nonan, who dedicated his life to the Dharma. Individuals like my new friend, Bhante Sumedha, who has dedicated his life as a monastic to the Dharma. Doing his best to establish a a monastery here in Dallas called the Brahma Vihara Monastery. It's all the the teachers that are offering instruction through MOI. These are individuals that have dedicated themselves to Dharma practice, to the sharing of Dharma with others. So the merit of practice. So it's just just a a short paragraph. And again, this is uh, from Joseph Goldstein. When I take refuge before a meditation period, I express it in this way. I take refuge in the Buddha and the awakened mind. I take refuge in the Dharma and the noble path. I take refuge in the Sangha of realized beings by the merit of generosity and the other paramitas, perfections. May my heart and mind be purified of all defilements 
and may I quickly attain liberation for the welfare and benefit of all beings. Every time I do this, I am reminding myself of what each of the refuges actually means, of what is necessary for purification, of the actual goal of practice, and of the motivation of bodhicitta. And at the end of the sitting, I will dedicate the merit to the welfare, happiness, and awakening of all beings. We can each find for ourselves the words that inspire us and develop strength and rapture in our hearts and minds. I'm just going to reiterate by reading that last line again. We can each find for ourselves the words that inspire us and develop strength and rapture in our hearts and minds. And this is what's available to you. Sit, close your eyes, direct the attention inward, Place the attention on the breath. Be mindful of your breathing. And you'll see that first insight. The mind will begin to wander. And when the awareness returns, you'll wake up from that dream. You will become lucid to the dream. And you can begin again. And the merit of your practice is that what you do there in that time not only benefits you, <clears throat> benefits everyone you come in contact with. You truly are practicing for the benefit of others. When you practice, you're coming to a fuller understanding of your own heart and mind. You are practicing the first noble truth. You're coming to an understanding of dukkha. And how that benefits others in profound ways is that upon your own willingness, fortitude, and courageousness of heart to be with your own suffering, to go through that suffering, come out the other end, to take responsibility for yourself, <clears throat> to meet that pain in your life that benefits others in how you are then able to meet their pain, their suffering with wisdom. The understanding, ah, I know what you're going through, I know that pain. There was um, a talk from Joseph that I recently listened to, and he just made this really simple um, example. The pain that you feel in your knee when you're meditating, that's the same pain that somebody on the other side of the world feels when they're sitting in meditation and they have a pain in their knee. So you practicing there in Nebraska or wherever you might be viewing this video from, that pain in your knee, just like the pain, just like that same human pain that somebody practicing in Burma is feeling. And so when you, in your practice, begin to see clearly the sensation of that, and you begin to see clearly how the mind is in relationship to that sensation, and you find that understanding that 
the mind can be in relationship to that sensation without aversion to it, without craving for an idea of some other sensation. When the mind can be free of that craving and be with what is, and find that freedom from suffering, still experiencing the unpleasant feeling tone, still experiencing the pain, but free in relationship to that pain. That's the insight, that's the wisdom that then is going to help you meet the next person with pain in their knee or any other pain. You're gonna have that understanding of, ah, I've looked carefully at my own dukkha. I've looked carefully at my own pain. And I see now that you are in pain. And I have this wisdom. I know how to respond. I can respond with metta. I can respond with compassion, understanding. I can respond with wisdom. Most important to respond with wisdom. It's a, it's a dangerous thing to go out trying to save people. To save people from their experience without wisdom. And so what does all of that mean? I love the Dharma. <laughs> well, I think that's all I have to share tonight. As I kind of wrap things up, I will just share with those who are at the house and those who are watching. It's, it's a lot more comfortable to be uh, sharing the practice with people when you're in front of them. For me here, uh, talking to uh, the screen, to the video. <laughs> but I know you're all there, and I appreciate you all so much for being attentive and patient. And I just wish for you all to really experience the great many benefits from a life dedicated to practicing the Dharma. So wonderful is a life that has dedicated itself to being on this path So may you all experience such a life. I'm wishing you all a very good evening. Enjoy your time together and enjoy the tea. Uh, give Kyle a helping hand. <laughs> And uh, many thanks to Kyle, to Mark, to Anne, and um, uh, missing you all there at the house. And I look forward to uh, coming back to visit soon. I have a baby due any day, any day now. Uh, the mom is doing great. 
we've had a very, very good pregnancy and uh, life is good. Life is so wonderful. Yeah, everything is wonderful. <laughs> and so mom's doing good and uh, good pregnancy. And yep, uh, next time you see me on the screen or the next time you see me in person, I will officially be a dad. That's 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 the direction we're going. So, and uh, I know you all have a picnic coming up. There's the picnic on uh, I think it's August seventh. If I got the date wrong, I think it's August seventh. Maybe it's August eighth. No, it's August seventh. Anyway, enjoy yourselves. Have a wonderful time at the picnic. And um, yeah, so thank you all. Thank you so much for being with me. And so let us dedicate the merit of this time together. May the benefit of this practice of our time together, of sharing the Dharma, of practicing the Dharma, may this be a benefit to ourselves and to all beings without exception. We offer the merit of this practice as a gift freely offered May it be of benefit to all beings everywhere. <laughs>